Hey, 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 guys. Welcome to Building This Community. This is your city business and policy development podcast. We're your hosts, Luke Patrick and Andrew Klump. Welcome to this week's episode of Building This Community. Our guest this week is Ben Smock. He is the Director of Development at Canopy, which is a nonprofit organization set out to help uh, positively impact Kentucky businesses uh, in their practices, their principles, uh, including sustainability and other facets of business. Uh, With that said, Ben, how are you? Hey, I'm doing well, Andrew. Good to be here. How are you doing? Doing great. Thanks. Uh, thanks for joining our show. Uh, I gave a little bit of your background um, and a little bit about Canopy, but can, can you just kind of talk a little bit right now about yourself and maybe your background? Yeah, of course. So I am a native Kentuckian, native Louisvillian. Uh, so I lived here, you know, my, my whole life. Um, I tell people that I have dual citizenship because I went to UK for my undergrad degree in uh, business management and Spanish. And then I got my MBA at uh, U of L. So, you know, lifelong cards fan. (laughs) And, uh, you know, I definitely claim dual citizenship depending on where I am throughout Kentucky. Um, That's a smart political move. (laughs) <laughs> you know, uh, yeah, yeah, I have no interest in politics, but, you know, I, I still remain, <laughs> you know, mindful of, uh, of that as it pertains to my work, you know, especially. And so, you know, that's that's my educational background and kind of always have had this, you know, focus on business development, but conscious business development. And I think somewhere along the way, um, you know, societally speaking, we kind of decoupled the conscious side of capitalism and so my work is dedicated to recoupling that and uh and i've had a career mostly in the the nonprofit industry and so that started with uh, norton healthcare i was working at their foundation right out of college i then transitioned to metro united way which is an incredibly impactful organization here locally and globally really united way worldwide does amazing work and that was a real uh, fantastic learning opportunity for me in terms of, you know, the understanding that I was able to gain from the community perspective, the, you know, complex, deep seated challenges that we face as communities and a little bit into what's required to find the appropriate solutions. And so I was able to work at United Way for a number of years and really build up my, you know, professional development and wherewithal in in regards to, you know, sustainable business development. And then that is what led me to Canopy. I was actually working with Canopy's founder uh, when I was at United Way and helping him kickstart an initiative with his employees. He runs a janitorial service company when he's not the, the founder of Canopy. And I was working with him to implement a free tax prep service program and financial literacy courses for his janitors working at FMS there. And so, you know, we got to talk in and he was uh, saying a little bit about Canopy and then the rest is history. He needed uh, somebody to oversee his developmental efforts and I was the guy. Well, Ben, that's honestly super interesting, but can you tell us a little bit more about what Canopy is and, and what you all do as a business? Yeah, of course. So Canopy is a startup nonprofit organization We're based in Louisville, but we are representative of the entire state of Kentucky. And our mission is to grow Kentucky businesses to positively impact people, our planet, and our future. Our work really centers around education, certification, connection, and growth. Uh, And so what that really means is that, you know, we want to want to educate people as to the importance of the socially conscious and environmentally conscious business movement, why this is important for businesses in terms of sustainability, why uh, consumers should be thinking this way, why it's a a, a better investment decision, and why it ultimately will drive economic impact for the state of Kentucky. And so, you know, we're we're educating folks, we are certifying businesses. And so what that means is that we have built a certification program with an incredible amount of research that is, you know, helping guide businesses along this path towards greater uh, intentionality with their social and environmental programming. And so that, you know, it, it starts simply and it, and it gains sophistication over time. And our goal is to guide businesses along, you know, that, that everybody is, is, is along a path 
and we can help businesses really adopt and operationalize their good that they have in their heart. And it's that conscious side to capitalism. So, you know, we, we certify businesses. And if you think about it, kind of like the, the Kentucky proud version of good business, it's a seal of appro approval. People will trust it. People will know what it means. Businesses will, you know, know that when they're looking for potential suppliers and things like that, that the canopy seal of approval means that this company stands for more than just making a quick buck. So um, do, do you all primarily focus on benefit corps or B corps? Uh, so, or is, is it more of like an incubator for, for businesses generally? Yeah. So, you know, it's, it's definitely something that we are similar to uh, the, the, the certified B corporations. And basically the, the story of Canopy is kind of born out of the Kentucky adoption of the B Corps. Um, so uh, B Corps are a global entity. It's this global movement, you know, for, for companies who, who want to do good for the world and for people. Um, it's, it's an opportunity for them to gain certification and to really leverage that in terms of, you know, how they find the right customers, suppliers, and all that good stuff. It is very rigorous. It, it takes a long time to go through. It costs a lot of money. Uh, Scott's company, the janitorial service company, they are a B Corp. Uh, first janitorial service that's a B Corp in the world, actually, which is a really cool story. And they are one of eight in Kentucky. B Corp's been around for about 20 years, and there are only eight of them in Kentucky. And so what that says to me is that the rigor that's applied to B Corp is too much. So we need to create a program that is designed to operationalize the good hearts within businesses, but to create an added level of accessibility to it. So, so you're talking about the difficulty of becoming a B Corp and your role's role in helping them, but what is a B Corp then? Like, and why are they so important? Yeah, of course. So uh, certified B Corporations are businesses from throughout the world that meet the highest standards of verified social and environmental performance, public transparency, legal accountability, you know, that, that balance profit and purpose, right? That, you know, when, if you're looking at it from a consumer perspective, you know, if I'm going to get a cup of coffee, then I want to go get a cup of coffee from the company that, you know, one has a good cup of coffee and two has this commitment to, uh, you know, sustainable sourcing or, you know, local impact, something like that, that there's this added level of importance uh, for this new, uh, you know, up and coming generation and millennials and generations that will follow us that people are demanding this more and more that it really creates that importance of being ethical, transparent in your dealings and with a sincere focus on your people and the environment. So uh, Ben, can you talk a little bit about maybe Canopy's principles and, and how you implement them in your all's business plan and whether or not you find that they're able to be incorporated in the businesses that you, uh, that you all work with? Yeah, of course, of course. And, you know, so our principles, um, mainly as it pertains to the, the Canopy Certified Program, which is what we work with Kentucky businesses to achieve. And, and our principles are uh, our, our simplicity, right? We, we need to create a, a certification program that is simple, um, not to suggest that it's not meaningful, but there has to be simplicity in terms of the time it takes, uh, simplicity in terms of the, the costs, the financial costs associated with it, and some other tenants too. Like right now, you know, think about business owners that, you know, are, are dealing with all things related to the pandemic. You know, if, if you, you want to operate a good business, but there are so many other uh, constrictions on your business that we need to create something that's simple. So simple is the first one. Accessible is the second one. Making it accessible regardless of if you're you know, App Harvest in Eastern Kentucky, which is this huge agricultural tech company that's raising a bunch of money, or your mom and pop shop in downtown Louisville. Accessibility is key. Uh, local centricity is important, right? You know, we, we were born out of Kentucky statistics that we typically rank poorly in some of the national metrics that matter, education, mental health, uh, you know, long-term physical stability, all of these things, smoking cessation. And so, the, the local importance is what really drives uh, local business and you know what consumers are looking for. And so that local piece is important. Uh, we want to create and consistently add value to these organizations. Uh, we want to, to offer educational content, uh, opportunities for connections and networking that are valuable to businesses, ultimately you know, sustaining businesses and seeing their growth over time. That's what we're all about. We want to see businesses 
thrive in this environment. And then we ultimately want this to be customizable. You know, if you're an organization that deeply cares about uh, racial justice, then you can customize your participation in the Canopy Certified Program to be a leader as it pertains to diverse, equitable, and inclusive practices within your workplace. Now, uh, those are all incredibly admirable goal, admirable goals, admirable principles. Uh, do you think that they're just easier to incorporate with uh, B Corps, or do you see those as being uh, a, a, a goal for uh, other businesses as well? You know, I think many businesses do this intuitively, right? You know, you, you have the, the, the barber in, in, you know, middle of Kentucky that offers free haircuts to single moms. You have, you know, local businesses that provide gear to the local softball team, you know, that, that, that basically looking after their neighbor. I think those principles are really applied to Kentucky businesses, especially when you get to like smaller communities, um, that, that that intuitiveness is there. People want to do good when they're operating their business. We need to create something that creates intentionality with that and collective impact overall so that when we can align the heart and the values of businesses to combat some of the consistent challenges that we see as a state, then we start to see some really amazing impact happening. And with that data that we will generate over time, we start to work alongside statewide economic development initiatives as an attraction and retention toolkit, attracting the right businesses here that want to be additive for Kentucky and retaining entrepreneurs you know, recently graduated college students so that they know that this is a, a, a premier ecosystem for, for this way of doing business. And so it's, you know, a lot of these, these values are already there. We just need to provide the roadmap for companies to be recognized for it. Now, you mentioned anecdotally a, a couple different areas where you saw uh, I, almost charitable donations go towards such as racial injustice or you know, maybe the single moms or the softball team. What are the types of charities that you typically see these donations go towards if there is uh, kind of a range? And are they more national or local? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, I think there's a lot of focus right now on donor choice, you know, being able to choose where your dollar goes. Now, you know, I come from United Way. And so back in the in the 50s, when United Way had their transformational idea for the payroll deduction program to where, you know, they would go into any company in the local area for their United Way and people would choose to, you know, deduct a dollar from each paycheck that would go to the United Way. And it was going to the one organization that would facilitate the work of so many others. Uh, and now people are more interested in you know, really aligning their dollars with organizations that speak to their passions or something that's personally affected them. So you see a lot of a lot of diverse donations. Um, I think there are national and international nonprofit organizations that are able to do amazing, uh, deliver amazing impact at scale. And there are also a lot of local nonprofit organizations that are kind of operating on a shoestring budget. And both are achieving really significant impact. And so, you know, I, I see I see donations going to both of those. Um, I, I think, you know, if you look at some of the like statistics around philanthropy, there there is an increase in individual giving, and it's being more widespread. So you're seeing more of the, you know, uh, you know, well represented piece of the pie going to different places. And so, like for me as an individual, I would give, you know. Uh, 20% of my philanthropic portfolio to United Way and 20% to the really small nonprofit that I know is doing really cool work in the West part of Louisville um, and, and similarly. So, you know, it's kind of going, it's going all over the place, but donor choice, donor choice is key. In the inverse of that, are there any charities that you would maybe like types of charities that maybe you would steer your businesses away from mm -hmm. that maybe don't line up to the principles of Canopy? Sure. You know, there, in order to become a 501c3 nonprofit organization, obviously you have to kind of already adhere to many of the, the values oriented perspectives of business that, you know, are evident in Canopy's values and what we foresee. I can't really think of any organizations off the top of my head that I would steer people away from. I would just reinforce 
you know, finding organizations that are near and dear to your heart? What do you care about? What has personally impacted you in your life? And where do you want your money to go? Um, and so I think it's a personal choice in that regard. And I think based on, you know, the, the IRS uh, status of being a 501c3 means that they are meeting these ethical standards. Now, I will also say there, there has been this focus, um, you know, of donors to look at things like overhead and you know fundraising expenses and things like that and i think that is an antiquated metric that people should not look at as much as they do now you have to you have to marry how much of the dollar is going and providing a service but you also have to look at the quality of employee needed to deliver really complex and important work and so we don't ask banking professionals what their overhead is or what their salary is. And we don't give them a hard time when they're doing well for themselves. So like, why do we ask the same things of nonprofits? And like, in my opinion, you know, the only difference between a nonprofit and a for-profit should be a tax status. And they're still, they still have to operate with the same sort of, you know, sophistication, operational efficiencies. They're still running a business. It just is in a different way. It's just their, you know, end users, their, their shareholders are the community instead of, you know, people sitting around a boardroom. So, uh, Ben, would you say that uh, your all's primary goal is primarily to cultivate local businesses with local ties, or, or are you comfortable with a startup that's, you know, looking to relocate outside of the region as soon as they, they've reached a scale? And, and how do you all uh, deal with those challenges? Yeah, you know, I think I think local centricity, local ties is is super important. Um, you know, I think our focus is to create a premier landscape in Kentucky that is ultimately a tool in the tool belt for statewide economic development. And, you know, there, there's a lot of value in that local supply chain. I think there is a lot of value as it pertains to attraction and retention of, you know, uh, employers and employees. And I think it really sets the stage for larger scale partnerships. Um, you know, we're we're in conversations with a, uh, a major manufacturer here in Kentucky, and they have suppliers across the globe. And they also have about 10,000 suppliers in Kentucky. And we're in conversations with them about utilizing the Canopy Certified Program as some sort of differentiator for their preferred vendor status or something like that, right? And so I think you know there's, there, there's importance of this local centricity and what we're building also speaks to that national scale. And so while the, the Canopy program is built out of simplicity and is meant to be adopted by any business, it ultimately rolls up to what the B Corp certification uses in terms of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. So we, we speak Kentucky, but we also speak globally in the same vein. And so I think there's that, there's that connection that needs, to, that needs to exist, and that's what we're trying to build. So y your goal then, right, is still just the business development, but do you see community engagement for Canopy, uh, such as, you know, branding or outreach, playing an important role? You know, how much do you need to have brand recognition for what Canopy is versus just working directly and having a network directly with businesses? Absolutely. You know, it's, it, that's a great question. Uh, our product and our work is absolutely best when we have diverse advocates and, you know, the, the element of our work that's centered around education is arguably the most important one right now. A uh, little story. So, so Scott, um, when he, his company was the first in Kentucky or the second in Kentucky to become a B Corp. And at the time, uh, state representative Jerry Miller was trying to pass legislation that would allow for businesses to formalize as what's known as a, a public benefit corporation, a PBC. So just like when you file with the Secretary of State, you can file as a PBC. Um, and basically what that means is that your business is protected, your owner is protected if you choose to you know, pursue a social environmental good. You can't be fired if you're spending a little bit more on like social programming with, with your employees or something like that. And, and it's good, it doesn't have a lot of teeth to it after that, but it's helpful and it protects owners. So Scott was, as a B Corp owner, and as somebody who's run his business in this very thoughtful way for a long time, he was asked to travel with the state representative, Jerry Miller, throughout Kentucky and speak with business owners, elected officials, uh, you know, Kentuckians in general. And 
you know, because Scott is of the B Corp movement, he was using words and phrases that honestly just didn't land with a lot of Kentuckians. You start throwing around triple bottom line, social enterprise, you know, uh, uh, you know, mm-hmm. socially conscious business development, things like that. And, and throughout Kentucky, and sometimes it goes over people's heads. And so, you know, you have to, you have to really focus on the educational side of things and articulating the business case. Um, and that looks different per audience. And so, for example, when we go to speak with business owners in Paducah, Kentucky, we need to be able to articulate that, yes, this is the, the, the moral argument here is that you should run a business that is supportive of people and the environment. The, the business argument is that it stands to increase your profits and employee retention by X number, right, and X percent. Those are the, the, the narratives we have to tell the business owners. For, for college students, we need to be able to let them know when they're thinking about you know, what companies they want to buy from, where they want to work, that they should consider companies that have this heightened sense of social responsibility uh, when they're making these decisions. And let's we'll speak with elected officials. We should we should tell them that there should be some sort of statewide preferential treatment for companies that are in pursuit of something like this. So it sounds though like most of your engagement is through uh, education and networking. Yeah. Is there, mm-hmm. there am I missing anything else, or, or is that still your primary goal? And then how? Are you still looking at trying to just basically attract as many businesses as possible right now? Is there kind of a limit to to your capacity? Yeah, you know, so we're we're a grassroots organization. We're basically, you know, three years from the back of the napkin. Uh, so a lot of our education and connection has been through the amazing people that we have on staff and the amazing advocates that we've had in our corner. Um, So we're very fortunate to have that strong network. Um, So it has looked pretty grassroots for for a little while. You know, we're startup nonprofit operating on a shoestring budget. And so we don't have the big marketing dollars. Uh, There's there's this guy, this um, consultant for nonprofit organizations, Dan Pallotta, and he will always say like, you know, Pepsi or Coca-Cola, their marketing efforts are super successful because they put a ton of money behind it. There's a Mm -hmm. reason that those are so successful. And then nonprofit organizations are happy to get like a billboard donated uh, for free for their event. But it's like the billboard that's behind a big tree that's on the expressway that nobody uses. And so, you know, (laughs) there's, there's, we have a very big need to get the word out there. We really rely on the grassroots efforts because we just don't have enough money to pay for all the things that we need right now. Um, we need to, to build that up. Absolutely. Um, and then what was your, your second question, Andrew? Just, just whether or not there is a capacity limit for what you all oh, can right. handle. Um, yeah. Or if you're just looking at, at, I guess, expanding as quickly as possible, scaling as quickly as possible. Yes. So the answer is at first, yes, we have to be mindful of, you know, our internal capacity. And so to put it simply, we have this program that is uh, delivered online that is mostly self-guided, but it's also very new and unique for the businesses that will be going through it. And that will require canopy team involvement, right? We are the experts. We need to help the businesses go through this. And we don't know exactly what that support will look like because our first round of companies going through this program will happen in November of this year. And so we need to start, and I'll, I'll use the word cautiously, although I don't know if that's the right word. We need to start and ensure that we can deliver quality service so that the product is ultimately uh, successful and meaningful for the businesses that are going through it. And then once we figure out and grow and sophisticate over time, we're gonna know exactly how many we can you know, take at any given time, whether it's like a cohort model, whether it's like a running list of companies going through this program, the goal, is to get it to a point to where our staff is able to, you know, facilitate this for any company in Kentucky that wants it. But right now, don't know what that magic number is. We got to start. We got to start and make sure that we're we're doing things the right way before we just blow it out. So, so Ben, are there any projects that Canopy or the businesses you guys work with are, are working on right now, or you see coming up that that you'd like to discuss? You know, anything you'd like to plug? Definitely. So. One, uh, two things really, uh, well, actually three. Uh, the, the first thing that I, that I would like to plug 
we recently concluded a campaign that was dedicated to supporting racial justice within the workplace. Um, and this was called the 27 Campaign and Fund. And essentially this campaign was uh, composed of, of two elements. The first was to recruit Kentucky businesses to uh, take action in support of racially just practices within the workplace by looking at internal policies and procedures and making sure that their culture is fair and equitable and that they can take steps to improve uh, we also encourage them to make public statements that, you know, support black communities, condemn racism, you know, and really suggest that good business is essentially anti-racist. And then donating a minimum of, of uh, $1,000 to the 27 Fund. And the 27 Fund is overseen um, it, by a new partnership that we're building, and it will be allocated to black-owned business owners and entrepreneurs throughout Kentucky. Um, you know, we're, we're very mindful un, of underrepresentation as it pertains to business owners and entrepreneurs. And so this, this campaign and fund was dedicated to provide ongoing educational resources for businesses and to create this fund that will become sustainable as an investment tool for, uh, for black owned businesses throughout Kentucky. And so we had 26 companies going through this program. Uh, we have about $50,000 in the fund. And we're now working on a partnership with a local organization um, out of Leadership Louisville called the Bingham Fellows. And they're gonna take this project and amplify. So expand the fund, expand the access to resources and educational content, and just create this more holistic sense of how businesses can be on a path towards racially just practices within the workplace. And so that's that's the first thing. Like that was amazing just to just, to, to rally the Kentucky business community to see the, the energy behind this and the, the willingness to support, um, you know, a lot, of, a lot of these challenges are difficult. You know what I mean? We had a lot of conversations with business owners that were asking us like, how do we, how do we make a statement publicly that is, you know, against racism that is in support of black communities without like potentially offending somebody and you know it's that's a real question that you think it's a no-brainer at times but it's a it's a real question you know businesses don't want to potentially sacrifice customers if they don't agree or something like that and it's so, great it's great that you're giving them that guidance too i think that's yeah. that's something that if people can get um an understanding and be on the same page mm -hmm. uh you you can have a lot more movement right yeah. Exactly, exactly. A safe, apolitical space with quality resources that you can use is exactly what we were after. And so, you know, we're super excited about that. Um, I think that will end up transitioning into other like micro campaigns that we can operate depending on, you know, uh, timeliness and, and, and needs that, that arise. Um, the other things that I want to uplift, I mean, the, the Canopy Certified Program is what at its core is Canopy is all about and what we're offering to, to businesses throughout Kentucky. And so we're, we're beginning that in November of this year. Uh, we will roll out with more companies in the first quarter of 2021. And there is, a, and I don't want to call it a, a waiting list, but there's like a, a letter of intent that companies can sign that say like, hey, I, I love this concept and I want, I want to put my business on the list to go through this. And, and the letter of intent is a non-binding way for us to, to be connected with you and to kind of walk with you through the process before it begins. Um, and so, so that's definitely the biggest thing on our horizon. Um, so, so any businesses can, can sign up going to canopyky.org. Um, and, you know, we're, we're collecting data points from individuals too. There's a, there's a charter for good business on our website. And if, you know, you as an individual believe that businesses should act in this responsible, ethical, transparent way, you can sign your name to it and be like, you know what, this is killer. I want to see this for Kentucky. I want this state to be, you know, known for this type of business development because typically we're kind of on the ass end of, you know, some of the important, important like uh, leaderboards. And so, you know, this is, this is something that we can really uplift and be first in. Um, so that's what I would, that's what I would lift up. So is there, uh, is there any way that people can get involved with Canopy and what, what would they need to do uh, if they needed help with their own business? How would they reach out to you guys? Yeah, so just starts with, you know, checking out our website. We were on there. If you want to connect with us, ask questions, you can learn 
more about our work, the programs, uh, upcoming events. Uh, so, so there's there's really not too much in the way of like volunteerism at this moment. Um, there, there are events coming up that we would love people to participate in and learn more. Uh, there is much to learn on our website and we as a team uh, are, are always happy to have these conversations because again, you know, the, the educational component to our work is so important right now. And, you know, essentially we'll, we'll have conversations with anybody that's interested and learning more, getting involved. And so that's the best way, visiting our website, our emails are on there and that's how you can connect with us. Fair enough. So you, you, you clearly have an integral role in, in the business community, especially with business, with B Corps um, and lifting them off the ground. What, what do you see the needs of businesses in, in the Louisville community? Mm. That's a good question. You know, I, I think, I think, um, I think there's a lot of needs uh, for the business community. I think it's it's figuring out how to build and sustain uh, business over time, right? And so I think you know you look at uh, what what's happened recently with with the global pandemic, and what we see is that businesses that have this elevated social and or environmental consciousness are those that are standing to do better, that are on by better financial footing through this and will likely be the ones who thrive as opposed to those who don't. And so I think businesses need this, this you know, added uh, level of connectivity between consumers and investors uh, and you know, uh, their employees so that everybody knows kind of what they're all about where they can find additional information if you know the pandemic is going on and they're still offering services or like you know they're providing if it's a restaurant that's providing you know relief meal relief programs to those in the service industry like I want to know about that because I want to go get my dinner from that restaurant because I know they're doing cool things um, so I think it's it's connectivity and especially considering like how people are thinking more and more you know in terms of the businesses that they buy from and work for you know, the, the, the narrative is important. And so I think businesses just really need to tap into that connectivity and be part of this good business network. Essentially a, a support system or yeah. Yeah, network between businesses. So you always know what what's going on with each individual industries and, and see how you can kind of help each other out. Absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, we're, we're building, uh, we're building this, this network that it will be comprised of the businesses that go through the Canopy Certified Program, uh, individuals who just love the movement, nonprofit organizations, elected officials who are interested in making legislative decisions and seeing like where the, the energy lies. And so what, what this will look like, and in one example is if like, if I recently graduated from college and you know, based on what research tells me, I'm a, I'm a you know, recent student that is interested in a good job, that is interested in working for a company that uh, also has a commitment to something I care about, then if I go into the Canopy Network, which is being built, then I can search for job opportunities based on either the area of job that I'm looking for or their social and environmental impact. If I want to work for a company that has, you know, a focus and loves like animals, then I can search that and I can find what companies are working in that regard and what job opportunities exist in there. You know, so it's this, this like added connectivity that's so important. And, you know, if you look at like Louisville as an example, there's so many nonprofit organizations in Louisville doing amazing work. And there's often, you know, a resource strain, right? Not uh, None of them really have enough resources as they would like. And so there's there's this opportunity to identify businesses that have specific areas of interest, you know, so if you're interested in animals and you want to, you know, um, devote some piece of your business towards that or incorporate that into your business practices somehow, then, you know, perhaps the local humane society sees that via the network and they make a connection and then they form an operational partnership that is supportive of the business that wants to, you know, help out the humane society and the humane society has a new partner in, in some way, whether it's, you know, financial or through volunteerism or advocacy you know, something like that. And so, you know, the, the networking and connectivity, you're, you're absolutely right. That's what we, that's what we need. 
Well, Ben, it's been great talking with you. We, we got to wrap it up. But before we let you go, we, we like to ask all of our guests this final question. If you had the ability to change one policy in Louisville, what would it be? Mm. I saw that on there. Uh, you know, that's a that's a great question. I think considering everything going on right now, I would, you know, focus on criminal justice reform um, and really, really making sure that, you know, sentencing, bail, parole, uh, reentry, things like that are, are paid close attention to. Um, I, I think we have a lot to work towards in regards to that and to correct some of the missteps that have been taken for a long time. Uh, so that would be, you know, the first thing that I would call out because I think it's particularly timely. I would also just say in general, you know, and this is more Ben speaking personally as opposed to, you know, taking off my canopy hat here. I think Kentucky and Louisville will need to be, you know, as more progressive in terms of, you know, some of the, the policies that we, you know, currently operate with in terms of like women's rights, uh, religion, uh, renewable energy and things like that. We, we need to be, we need to be progressive. We need to be mindful of what the future holds and, and how we can position our state to attract and retain the, the, the next generation of folks that are really thinking in this way. Um, and so, and then of course, putting back on the canopy hat, I would say local and statewide legislation that uh, supports and offers real benefits for businesses that are in pursuit of social and environmental change as a, as a business. Absolutely, man. I couldn't agree with you more. I really like that answer. <laughs> You cool, gave us thanks. three answers, but that was, yeah. that was, that was fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I couldn't decide, honestly. No, no, no shame in it. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much for stopping by. We really appreciate getting to talk with you today. Yeah. Yeah. I appreciate the opportunity y'all. And, uh, you know, uh, anytime. We'll pick back up with our reaction segment after a word from our sponsor. Luke, that was another great interview this week with uh, Ben Smock. And I think the, the very first thing that we need to do here is to clarify one small thing that, that may not have been apparent to our listeners. And that's the difference between a public benefit corp legal status and what the B Corp certification is. He hinted at it a little bit, but can you break that down for us? Yeah, and I think we we were kind of guilty of using the terms interchangeably. And I think I think most people referring to it, if you're not coming from a legal perspective, like there's not, uh, nobody's going to know uh, which to use in what mm-hmm. circumstance. But I, uh, so a B Corp, you know, is kind of the, it's a certification given out by a nonprofit uh, known as B Lab. And they list uh, certain requirements that a corporation needs to meet before they're uh, eligible for the certification. And it basically says that it's a corporation that is tr- trying to do some kind of public good, you know. Uh, but just getting that certification doesn't change anything about like your legal status, like the, the legal entity you created when you, you filed your incorporation documents with your secretary mm-hmm. of state, you know? Uh, so when you're forming your business, if you want to be a public benefit corporation, that is its own, that is a legal entity that, that's uh, separate and apart from like an LLC or a, a partnership, sole proprietorship, C Corp, all of like these other entities that you could choose to form when you're laying out your your business plan this is like a new version that's only arisen in the last 20 years i think ben said and uh and it might have started 20 years ago but it didn't really pick up steam until delaware uh chose to create uh by statute the public benefit corporation law uh for themselves and what uh what delaware does like the whole nation tends to follow when it comes to business law, most public, I don't know if it's most, but a huge number of uh, public corporations in the United States are registered in Delaware because they offer uh, a variety of benefits, most of them tax related, you know, it's a, uh, it's just like a typical corporation gets their tax benefits and other things through. through Exactly. Well, and and, and the other thing too, that I think it needs to be clarified is that Kentucky, we've only had benefit corps, since 2017 yeah exactly but the thing that's also kind of confusing is that right you don't have to be a public benefit corp to apply for a b corp certification Certification. from b lab or to get a canopy certification either 
right? Yeah, no, 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 no. You just have to, your business just has to, uh, and I'm blanking on the exact guidelines that were laid out. And I think uh, it, it might vary uh, slightly based on the size or structure of your business. I think that's on B-Lab's website, but the, you just have to follow the criteria that they lay out and they will certify you. It, it's similar to like a Better Business Bureau rating. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just something that you would use to advertise, like hold out to the community and be like, we're a B-Lab or we're a B Corp. You know, we're certified by B-Lab. Like we're doing a public good, you know, or that's the goal of our, of our corporation. And so uh, what an actual public service corporation or public benefit corporation, excuse me, uh, means in the legal sense, when you're forming the entity, it just means that in the purpose section of your incorporating documents, that you're able to expand upon it, uh, you're able to add purposes aside from just profit maximization for your shareholders. Like every corporation in America has a purpose of making money, you know? And so the terminology they use is uh, uh, seeking maximum profit for our shareholders or something yeah. similar. Yeah, and so I think the other thing that's important here too, Ben noted that if you are a public benefit corp, it kind of protects the owners a little bit more from, you know, maybe if they're, they're donating particular amounts of the profits from their corporation into specific causes. Uh, but from your research and from our, you know, maybe our, our gut reaction, do you really think that they're more protected? Because, it, because when I see it, I see a, a, a corporation like a, a general C corp, that the, oblig the obligation, the fiduciary responsibilities of the executives and the directors are to maximize profits, right? But oftentimes, you know, companies like Amazon or big corporations donate money because one, they get tax right off for it, and two, they get the branding. And people are looking more at the ethos of companies and, and, and trying to actually protect or, or, or find companies that are trying to benefit the world. So, do you think it adds any extra layer protection? So uh, it could, and, and that, as of right now, I think that's kind of an unanswered legal question. So uh, in a traditional corporation, I guess you could envision a scenario where you donate an amount of money that goes beyond what you can write off on your taxes. Mm -hmm. And it ruffles some feathers on the board and you as a CEO maybe are subject to some litigation for breach of fiduciary duty. You know, like you can imagine that scenario and the arguments you would make in a traditional corporate setting are, it's kind of tough, you know, cause like the, the purpose of the business is to make money mm -hmm. for traditional corporations. Well, you'd still have the branding argument, right? You but could still say, yeah, you're buying goodwill. It's advertising. All of those arguments are on the table, but when you're a public benefit corporation, when you are registered in that manner as that legal entity, then you can add in extra purposes in that purpose segment. And if you have like the purpose of, you know, improving the community or so, I don't know if it would be that broad or, or, you know, maybe, uh, maybe incentivizing like education for our employees or something mm -hmm. like that. Uh, if you go above like uh, and beyond in your spending and, and you're spending more than you can write off on your taxes, but it goes towards the purposes that are listed on your incorporating documents, then I think you have a much stronger argument as a CEO that you aren't in breach of your fiduciary duties. I think it makes the litigation process yeah, much you, harder. You get that document that you can take to the courtroom and just say, look, I'm protected. Or even even if, they, if it's not settled, and quite honestly, even corporations – I think they'd still, they're still probably oftentimes protected from, from something like that. But, you know, this is just a slightly higher threshold, I guess, that, that, that they're getting yeah. as far as potential protection. But, you know, it, exactly. it's all circumstantial and the courts are really kind of undecided on it. Um, yeah, and there, and there hasn't, like I said, it's kind of an unanswered legal question because there hasn't been uh, substantial uh, litigation regarding this issue. Like there hasn't been a breach of fiduciary duty in a public benefit corporation that has attracted enough attention that the, the really precedent setting case mm -hmm. yet, you know, so we don't know. Yeah. And so I, I think we're running into the issue with the, the same thing with the cooperative uh, segment we did or episode we did last week is the, the danger of boring our guests, our listeners with 
just legalese. Yeah, just beating but, over the head. So yeah. let, let's talk more of like why should we be supporting Benefit Corps and, and are they actually being as successful as other typical corporations? Yeah. Okay. So that actually coincides nicely with the the paper that I read getting ready for this week. It was uh, the future or fancy an empirical study of public benefit corporations. And what they tried to do was try to determine whether or not being structured as a public benefit corporation affected the amount of investment that these firms were receiving, you know, in the early stages of, uh, of uh, their business. And so they looked at the just under 300 uh, public benefit corporations that were registered in Delaware between, I think, 2013 and 2018, and tried to analyze the amount of investment dollars that they brought in uh, compared to, you know, traditional corporations. And, and they mm-hmm. found that that almost 300 corporations, uh, public benefit corporations in Delaware raised something like $2.5 billion. So it's not simply being structured as a public benefit corporation doesn't seem to have, it does have some impact. It's slightly below what um, traditional corporations were bringing in uh, based on their model, but it's not a super substantial impact. Uh, And it it definitely doesn't turn off the investor class. Like I think a lot of people would have argued at the outset of this kind of uh, public benefit corporation movement. Yeah. And so, but is, is there the danger though, because, you know, we talked about the legal status of the only thing that you have to have is, is that amended purpose. Yeah. I mean, if a venture capital firm decides to buy into a public benefit corp that says they're going to help animals, what then is the requirement that if all you have to do is have a broad purpose statement, it doesn't really seem like there's too much of a burden on those public benefit corps unless they're going and applying for these certifications, maybe from like a national network, like B labs or from a more of a local one, like canopy in Kentucky. Yeah, no, exactly. And I mean, like you can think of, I I like the, the animals example, but I think a more common one that people would be familiar with is like pharmaceuticals, you know, like a lot of people give them criticism for, you know, overcharging the American market. You know, they, they, I would say kind of price gouge Americans like compared to uh, like pharma- pharmaceutical sales overseas or, or in other countries. And, uh, but uh, they could amend their purpose and say the purpose of our business is to uh, create life-saving medical treatments and they wouldn't be wrong. Mm-hmm. You know, that, that's not, you know, in addition to maximizing, maximizing profit for our shareholders. Uh, and so uh, you could imagine a scenario where a pharmaceutical corporation might, or could potentially reorganize as a, as a public benefit corporation and meet all of the criteria or just get the certification from B-Lab. And they very likely fit all the criteria, but they aren't necessarily doing the public good that one would assume when you hear the term public benefit well, corporation. I, and I think that's, but I think it de- depends on how you phrase it, right? Because there could be uh, a pharmaceutical company, for example, that, does actually indeed fit those and fits all those in an ethical and completely substantive way versus a different inverse uh, pharmaceutical company that tries to cut corners, tries to gouge. I mean, so it is definitely very much situational, I I think. And ultimately, I believe that these uh, certification programs are really good because they kind of substitute for what the government is lacking and because it's in the private sector, it allows for them to be more, uh, how you say, div- specific, I would, I guess, as far as who gets in and who doesn't, right? If they have a foundation, if they have funds that, that, that they're looking at, at, that they can use as capital to vet all these different businesses that are applying to, to get their certification, then I, th- I think that they should be the ones that actually keeps those maybe less pro community good companies f- from getting those uh, certificates inadequately. Yeah, no, no, I, I see what you're saying. Uh, and I think it's true when you're doing it from, when you're uh, talking about like B lab and the certification, I think they would have a like much greater deal of autonomy in like weeding out people that are, trying to do this uh, essentially in name only and not really making like the impact that, that people 
you know, would associate with that term, like a, like a benefit corporation. Really, this whole thing uh, ties into the conversation, like a greater national conversation that's taking place about the, the purpose of uh, major corporations. And you see it in things like the, the Business Roundtable, which is a nonprofit that's uh, open to CEOs of major corporations. Like you can picture like Tim Cook, uh, Jeff Bezos, I know remembers, uh, I'm assuming most CEOs of Fortune 500 companies are, are in there, a party to it. Uh, but the Business Roundtable about a year and a half, maybe two years ago, they released um, a statement saying that uh, basically the, the Milton Friedman kind of freshwater economic approach of like the sole purpose of business is to make money for shareholders is maybe not a workable model uh, in modern times. And um, I think there was some pressure, you know, from uh, certain movements, you know, you've seen like a drive to socialize medicine. And so maybe these corporations felt uh, the pressure to kind of uh, broaden their, their business model. They, they want to move, I guess, away from a purely shareholder driven model to a more inclusive kind of stakeholder model where everybody affected by a business uh is considered in the decision making process. Well, I think what you're saying with that too is it's more that, that's still more of the the publicly traded companies too. I those mean, are yeah yeah, yeah those it's, are it's huge totally different for you, the mom and pop shops and, and yeah yeah no, no. Uh, and I think the other aspect of this then is if what they're doing here is pulling these companies are instead of just focusing purely on profits they're extending into this branding should there be more states stepping in and defining more of what public benefit corps are? Because there se that seems to be really blending into corporations more and more. And especially if you can apply to be a to get a, a B Corp status or canopy certified status anywhere. I mean, shouldn't, shouldn't there be some sort of difference? And, and I, to answer my own question and you can weigh in, but, I think the answer is we don't know, and maybe we need to wait ten years to see where benefit corps go because yeah. they're still changing. They're still getting tinkered with by different states a little bit. Yeah, not even every state. I don't believe every state has this designation yet. You know, it's still a growing trend. So, so we just need to wait and see, maybe ten years or so, or ever, however yeah. long, and make the decisions to go from there. But, but with that said, what what we need to get at here, and the, part of the reason we had been on the show is people need to be aware of what benefit corps are because i know that benefit corps in kentucky i'm sure they get support but if you are a benefit corp or get the b corp status that label slapped on you in new york or la those cities are getting you know way more profit sharing you'd say it's a big city but people are obsessed with it on coastal cities, yeah. right? And it really drives business for them. But in Kentucky, a part of it's a branding thing that people just don't know what that is or what it means. And so that's why I think this podcast was so important because if people know that, that, that there are B Corps in the city that are, that have been created as B Corp, as benefit corps and have that and are certified and have that purpose, you know, being certified is really important here, right? and have that purpose, then they're probably going to be more likely to support it. But if you just hear B Corp, most people don't know what that is right now, at least in the no, state. Uh, no, absolutely. And I mean, I, I think you're exactly right. There's a huge benefit uh, right now, given the current market, in being viewed as a socially conscious uh, organization. You know, uh, people want to, you know, shop at like environmentally friendly, like uh, labor friendly, like union friendly mm -hmm. businesses. That's like, that's a, a clear trend in the market. And so that also raises a, an issue. Some of these companies might be applying for that type of certification or that uh, the, the B Corp certification or uh, even structuring themselves as a public benefit corporation, almost to kind of like, purpose wash their 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 business but that would but see that gets back though to it being you know like a vc fund venture capital fund jumping in to purchase a majority share of a public benefit corp and then scaling back the public benefit part 
of the corporation focusing more on profits. Yeah. But that again goes back to why the certification programs are really important and yeah. how they can kind of weed out some of those yeah. areas. And that's why the work that what Canopy doing Canopy is doing is so important and so good. And so that's why, you know, they need to get more publicity in my opinion, and people need to be aware of what they're doing. And just like what he was mentioning on top of all of this, they're providing mentorship, you know, to deal with racism, you know, trying to come out and be and have the, the proper stances on those things, trying to come out and, and come through, you know, dealing with coronavirus, you know, the mentorship, I, I don't think can be overlooked either. So, and that's on top of what they're, what the benefit corps themselves are doing already for the community. Uh, but with that said, I, I do want to give a little bit of a plug one more time for uh, Canopy. And that's that they have their own podcast series called Canopy's or called uh, Mind Your Wake. And it's just sharing ideas in good business, ethical business. And then they also have their own charter for good business. So if you believe your business is, has the potential and responsibility to positively impact people and our planet, you can you know sign your name and your your uh, company for the the Canopy's Charter for Good Business, uh, and you can find that at charterforgoodbusinessky.com. And then I think if the, if you want to just get more involved with Canopy, you can go to canopyky.org. I, I think they're doing phenomenal work, and, and I think it's really important that people understand what benefit corps are. And, yeah, I think in the, in, in the future we'll have to wait and see how public benefit corps go, whether there needs to be more state intervention into defining how they're different than corporations. But these certification programs like B-Lab and – Canopy are so integral to making sure that they're successful. I also want to take one second uh, before we wrap up. Uh, I want to make clear that just by changing the purpose section of uh, your incorporating documents, I don't want to undersell that as a small or, or menial thing. It can really result in major changes in the way that corporation is going to function, the way it treats its stakeholders and, and its corporate culture. I, I think as much as I might have pointed out that there are similarities between B Corps and traditional corporations, it's definitely a step in the right direction. And it's a major benefit that Kentucky now has this law. And I think, you know, I would, I would like to see it in every state. Yeah. And I think what we've done here today is we've given a very holistic look at this new law and seen that, that it's a net positive and it's really going to continue to help our communities going forward. And so I'm very glad that Ben joined us today because I, I, I think he shed a lot of light into this industry that not a lot of people know about. No, absolutely. Absolutely. You got anything else today, Andrew? No, nope, that's it, man. Everyone, uh, appreciate you listening. Yeah, thanks for tuning in, guys. As always, thanks for tuning in. Thanks for joining us on Building This Community. If you'd like any more information, you can follow us on Twitter at buildingthiscom, C-O-M, or you can follow Andrew at Andrew J. Klump. And you can also follow Luke at LMP43. Definitely subscribe, and we look forward to talking to you guys next week.